Hi, my name is Georgia Bastin and this is the Conversations for the Flow of Life. And I'm here today with the exquisite Michael Neal, whose camera may look a bit squiffy, but he'll be fine. Yeah, which way do I have to leave <laughs> myself look like? I should he never is the other that. side of the continent. <laughs> So, Michael, I explained roughly what he's about and the fact that it's looking at creation. And actually what came to me as I was walking my dogs around the garden between rain showers here was all these conversations. Are God talking to God? Hmm. For God's sake, don't tell anyone that, though. <laughs> you know. I mean, that's right, but, you know, it sounds pretentious. Don't, don't, you don't want to say that. <laughs> no, well, it's, when I, you know, whether you describe it as God or life energy, whatever you wish to give it a name of, it's really that simple. Hmm. Just coloured in the flavour of us. Yeah, I, I remember the first time I ever described it that way was, was bizarrely in, in retrospect, working with a, a sales guy mm. and he'd come for, for coaching. And I just said to him, I mean, look, really all sales is, is God selling God to God. What did he and say? It, it landed so deep. We really never went, it, that, that was it. Like we, that became, the rest of our time together was just mm -hmm. seeing the truth of that more more deeply and it, it you know for me and maybe i'm jumping the gun maybe you're going to ask me a question that would have set up this answer better but one of the most powerful things about coming to life from a creator place it's not like ultimate creator like not like the, the, the creator of everything, but just as a creator, is it, it, it's an unlimited energy. It, 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 it's tapping into something that is pre-existing. And so mm -hmm. it is inherently available, it is inherently possible, and it is, it can be relatively effortless. And I say relatively because I've never created anything that really was effortless, effortless as, and I didn't do stuff, but yeah. compared to the mm, kind of effort, the scrunchy faced effort. And that when you come to life as a creator, there's no stress in it. When you come to life as a supplicant, as a seeker, there's a lot of stress in it because you're very dependent on life and other people to do your bidding. And, 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 and that's just, you know, I, I sometimes use the analogy of if I offered you two jobs, one is to go into a room of, of, of people and um, raise a million dollars for a good cause. Um, and the other is to go into that same room and distribute a million dollars for a good cause. Which job would you find easier? And, and I mean, maybe one in a hundred people for reasons of interpretation will say they'd rather go get the money than give it. And it's, it, it is, it's like you start to see, oh, we can always be coming from that place, that space of giving of creation because we're not giving of our limited resources. We're giving of this energy. Yes. We don't, we don't tire out. We don't run out. We don't, exhaust ourselves, we don't um, get taken advantage of because we're not giving from a limited source. It, it, it's, it's, it's like if I'm sitting by the river and people are you know, asking for water, nobody can take advantage of me by stealing an extra glass. I'm sitting by the freaking river, right? At some point I will probably say the river's right there, you don't need me, but-, but <laughs> But it's not the, the reasons that we have for, oh, I can only do this much, or I, I, you know, I wouldn't want to give too much, or I, you know, I can't just be about that because I need to get. It's like, well, there's an inevitability that if that's the energy that's going out, it's going to come back, you know, and it'll come back in various forms. 
Well, I'll never forget one of when I did Emerging Voices with you. You won't remember this, I'm sure. But it was a, a moment of seeing or experiencing. We were all sitting there, obviously on Zoom. And you said, OK, you've got 10 minutes. Write a story about a rabbit. And it was like, all right, a story about a rabbit in 10 minutes. And bam, it was there. And it was just a case of picking up the paper and it beautifully unfolded. A bit wacky, but that was how it just wanted to arise through me in that moment. But it was literally one of those moments I can still feel sense being right now. Yeah. And that was such a pivotal moment because I know when I sit down to write now, it's not a different moment. It will always work the same way. Yeah. And you just put more or less interference in the way. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I, We've I, had conversations. You obviously haven't done just finished getting real, in which you went, I'm never doing that to work again because life got really real. <laughs> <laughs> and my experience of being in a really cool place about this physical form and then deciding to do a course on it and, mm. and doing a, offering a three weeks and going from a really cool place to, oh, my God, I am hearing every thought I have ever had or maybe the universe has ever had about the dissatisfaction and the unhappiness and the everything. And we've had conversations about this and I can remember you saying to me, yeah, but it won't put us off. And going, oh. And it came to me the fact that we, when we look a certain way, as human beings, as how we work, all the creative stuff that was there that we've believed about life gets created again. So it's only old thoughts that were created that we just fall back into, but we just hear them all again. Well, I think there's something about and I, I probably, you and I probably have spoken about this, but I've always heard we teach what we most need to learn as a strategy, not an insult. Uh, I like that, yeah. Like people go, oh yeah, you know, if you're teaching, and it, it, it's sort of like a put down, like, you know, oh, you know, they're teaching that because that's their issue. You know, oh, they got, they're, they're doing a counseling degree because they need counseling. They're, you, know, you, you know, it's that, whereas for me, it's like, oh no, this is how it works. When we focus on something, our attention and awareness suddenly hears what's always been going on around that. Yeah. And that's, that's what leads to liberation and change mm -hmm. is because what was invisible is now visible. And when it's visible, it's easy to delineate and distinguish and navigate. When it's invisible, it's really hard. I think I, I don't remember I mentioned on Getting Real, but I watched uh, the, the the movie Super Pets uh, the other day, which is about Superman's dog and and uh, his, I his, haven't seen it. his animal friend saving them. Really? That's weird. Um, but but <laughs> one, one of the one of the running gags in the movie was that uh, the that one of the dogs kept bumping into Wonder Woman's invisible plane. And, and hitting his head and, 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 you know, they should put a sign up, but, but like, that's how it is in life. When it's invisible, we keep bumping into it and we don't know why, and we don't understand. And it's annoying when it's visible. It doesn't really take much effort to, to avoid it or go around it or even use it. Yes. Which of course in when you're writing is always what you're drawing from. I mean, I know um, I've been doing some writing course with a beautiful teacher called Jules Wells. I'm sure you possibly know her. 
And on one of the first courses, she said, you know, don't be your past, use it. And it was a very interesting process to go through, to be, to actually learn to go back hmm. and be able to walk away from it without bringing it back to the moment. But of course, it's, it's everything that we've learned. Hmm. And my learnings, in essence, are no different to everyone else's. Well, I think the power is that they aren't and they are. So mm. there's a universality to experience. So in many ways, when we get honest and specific, we become more universal and relevant. Yeah. You know, um, I think it was Robert Frost, the poet, who said, no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. Yeah. Like if you're not willing to go there, you can't really take anyone there. Mm -hmm. But if you're willing to go there, people, not everyone, but people will, will come. They'll come with you. They'll recognize themselves. They'll, it will evoke their stories. It will um, captivate their imagination. They will cast themselves as the hero in your story. They will yeah. imagine themselves into it. You don't have to do that bit. You just have to write honestly and, and, you know, we can say from the heart or from just as clean as you can. And, and the way people's minds works will do the rest. We're great creators, aren't we? I know when I read Steve Chandler's book, Creator, and I think I cried through a lot of it. Yeah just for the recognition of, yes, we're all, all of that. And again, understanding, as you're talking about, that creativeness of he opened his heart and he shared everything he was on the page. Yeah. And, and Steve is a great example, just because I happen to know him, of somebody who really I just, lives, he lives from <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, you've got to be some perks. <laughs> no, but, 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 you know, there's a certain element to which it can be neurotic and, and, and that, but there's an element to which most creators I know, and by creator, I mean people who identify with that aspect of life. They think of themselves that way. They celebrate completion by starting the next one. Right? It's not like, phew, I don't have to do that again for another three years. It's, it, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Let me start on the next. And it's because there's such a freedom in being in that creative flow that you don't really want to take yourself out of it. It's not exhausting, so you don't need a break. And, and yeah, you find ways of marking. I, I, I have a, a former client who... Um, writes and makes movies and you know he, his way of marking the the completion is he starts on the next one and buys a piece of art that for him connects to the project so there is a marker there is yeah. something oh yeah that was from when we made that movie but 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 it's not a how, how long can i live off my bank balance till i need to create something else it's a I, I want to be in this energy. I want to stay in this creative energy. You know, and, and it feels like breathing and it, taking that every breath that is life sustaining when you're in that flow. Yeah, I mean, when you, I, I don't necessarily think of it exactly like that, but just hearing you say that, the image that came to mind is oh, I can stop breathing for three months. That was hell. Exactly. It's it like, wait, what? <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't actually follow. I don't know if you know. That. But, 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 but that's the thing is when you are creating from flow, through flow, as a part of flow, you know, that's, you don't want to disconnect from that. You know, I'm a big fan of the, the Tao Te Ching and, and 
more Taoist philosophy than practice because Taoist practice tends to be very rigid and strict and oddly un-Taoist to me. But, but, but just this notion that there is a pre-existing flow in life, there is a pre-existing intelligence, there is a pre-existing unfolding, and we are either living in harmony with that or we're out of harmony with that. We're either flowing with the river, ignorant of the river, and occasionally we splash in it or wonder why we're getting wet, or actively fighting the river because we want we think the river should go somewhere other than where it's going. Whereas creativity in a pure sense is, is just noticing the river and seeing where it wants to take you and allowing, you know, and you can allow yourself diversions like you've got 10 minutes to write a story about rabbits. <laughs> Right, that's that's it's fine. Story. <laughs> the river doesn't care whether you're to the right. left or the right, or like that's that's not within its purview. But but I, I I often talk about you know in my work effortless success, effortless creativity, effortless productivity, and the analogy that I love for it is it it's the difference between walking barefoot on a dry riverbed with a canoe on your head where yeah, you can go as far as your will will take you, but you're gonna, you're gonna get there with really sore feet. You're gonna be pretty tired and you're really not gonna be in a hurry to do it again. Mm. Or you can take the time and it doesn't have to be a long time for the river to fill up. Then you put the boat down, get in the boat, let the river take you. And then there's, yeah, you'll stop along the way if it's pretty, but not because you need a break just because you want to enjoy wherever the river's taking you. And of course, if we can, if we could only see that, that is the same in every part of life, not just when we're writing or when we're painting or doing the gardening that it is actually it works through everything yeah like there's there's a, a a style of creativity and i i think of jack kerouac as having been in america in the 50s sort of one of the the progenitors of it one of the the the, the, the you know where he would write his typewriter instead of having individual sheets he'd have rolls of paper hooked up to his typewriter. So there was never, he never pulled out a page. He just would type and type and type and type and type and type and type. And, type and they wound up with a, you know, a roll of writing. That, that, that kind of stream of consciousness coupled with craft creates incredible art, whether it's, you know, painting or sculpture or music or, or, or writing. Whereas technique alone can create things that are pretty, but they don't tend to have that same connection. And stream of consciousness alone, there's inevitably good bits, but by yeah. itself, it's just like listening to the inside of somebody's head. It's like, you don't really want to get lost in there. <laughs> but there's something about combining the two where you yeah. really let it rip, but you know, hey, this is going to be revised and reiterated and revised and reiterated. And this idea of the, the one shot, oh, I wrote it all in one go. Well, you know, I, the Beatles wrote this song in 10 minutes. Yeah, that happens occasionally, but it's not the goal. It's one of the kind of cool things that happens occasionally. It's one of those, exactly, yes. I mean, you know, George Harrison did a talk, um, I listened to it recently, where, you know, he talked about the fact that you know when these songs arrived in moments that there was a really clear sense that it wasn't from them yeah and well, jim Carrey was an bob, actor bob dylan described it as um the songs are in the air and i just pull them down and of course there's the beautiful poet and her name totally escapes me in the moment actually it's not the poet it's the lady who wrote ah the name totally yeah. again the, poet, the, name. the poet's name i think is ruth stone and and the, well, she talks the, about being able to, to feel, the feel the words coming towards her and and running to catch them and 
that, you know, I don't want to miss this one. I, I can feel it, but I don't want it to get away. And, there's, and, and in that story, in, in her TED talk, she, Elizabeth Gilbert's TED talk, she describes the poet's experience of, of being a little bit too late to the typewriter and having to pull it backwards. And so the poem coming out backwards from the end to the beginning and then having to be reversed before being shared. And again, this is, this, the, this is poetic and this may sound, you know, if you're not used to creating, it sounds a little magical and mystical and weird and out there. But it's just trying to put words to this experience of creating. Mm. Where it's not going to happen without you, but you can't make it happen. Yeah. And so in the old days, they had the muses. Oh, well, you know, hey, it's in the hands of the muses. If the muse grants me the gift of poetry, then you shall have poems. If the muse grants me the gift of art today, you know, you shall have art and let me do this to please the muses. And, the, you know, it was, that was just another way of trying to make sense of the fact that it's either so easy or impossible. Oh, and that is so true. I mean, I know when I paint and I used to paint with a teacher. So there was a, someone always going yeah that's right that's wrong that's this that's that so i was very judgmental of what i produced many decades because yes i'm that old later when i started to paint again i was doing it from a whole different place of also this understanding of life or getting the feel of it actually even before i did super coach so there was something already tinkling there where something I could feel it baking, it was cooking itself, it was forming, it was, and then all of a sudden it was just there. All I needed to do was pick up the paintbrush and do it. And whenever I stepped in with thinking of, oh, should I use this color or that? A very different fear occurred as opposed to Okay, go away again. Just let me use you yeah. and see what comes to life. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 we we people who do this a lot, who create a lot, my experience is that they tend to lean one way or another in terms of either leaning towards, hey, I'm just a vehicle, I'm just a channel. You know, I just show up and see what comes through or it's a, I've got to, I've got to, you know, I'm going to do it and I'm going to, and it will, you know, I am the catalyst or I am the, I am the masculine or I am the feminine. I am the receiver or I am the driver. Now we're both like creation doesn't happen without a masculine and a feminine energy. It's not about male and female. It's just about receptive and, and active. It's about, you know, there you receive, then you create, then, you know, or you create and in creating, you start to receive. Like, like there isn't a right way to do it, but both energies are going to be present. Yes. Well, it has to be because there, there isn't a doer, but there's an action doer. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I think my favorite metaphor over the years has been midwifery, creative mm -hmm. midwifery, that, that, that I am assisting something in being born into form. Yeah. It's not quite mine, but I am a very active participant. And then sometimes I'm pregnant. Right, like, like I remember miracle. going. Okay, it's a bloody miracle. I remember <laughs> going. I, re I remember meeting with my literary agent and uh, and saying one what to him one night. Hey, can you take me out, get me drunk, and 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 prompt this because I feel like there's something there that wants to come out. Yeah. And, 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 and he did, he knew what I meant. Like I, that wasn't as weird to him as it might sound to somebody listening to us now. And, and, you know, and that was the space within, I think was the book that came out of that. You know, and it, it was already there. 
I didn't know what it was, but I could feel there was something wanting out. And, and, and so that's, again, as you do this more and more, you realize both that you can just show up and create something because somebody said, hey, tell us a story about rabbits. Yeah. But also sometimes it, 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 it's, it's in there and wanting out. Oh, definitely. I mean, I know when I can have moments of, and it can go on for a couple of days, just a, an uncomfort, just a, oh, something's really making me uncomfortable. And I can feel a bit crabby and a bit this and a bit that. And then all of a sudden just go, oh, just go and write, just go and pay, whatever it may be will come to me. But yes, as you say, there's that nudge, which can get very uncomfortable if you ignore it. Yeah, so I think of people like um, who work on deadline, you know, mm -hmm. people who write for newspapers or periodicals or, um, or just live on commissions for their work. So they have to keep creating work. Right, that that you 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 come to realize if I show up, it'll come. Right, so that the W. Somerset mom, or at least that's who I've always heard it attributed to, that I only write when inspiration strikes. Fortunately, it strikes every morning at nine a.m. promptly. Right, like there's something about that, mm. but then within that, once you know that, there's also a I remember an interview with a composer that I read years ago. Um, I think Michael Colgrass was his name, and he was being interviewed about, you know, are you working on something now? And he said, well, I've been spending a lot of time on my own fishing, so probably. Right? There's also that, just kind of knowing sometimes you just need to soak in it for a while, and then it'll come. And of course, the interesting thing is when I talk about, you know, that feeling of discomfort, do I even get to decide the time that it's ready to come out? Well, see, I think this is one of those questions that people want an answer to, and I don't think it helps. Because, there is one. <laughs> because sometimes would be the honest answer. And how would we know would be the other honest answer. Like, <laughs> like, like, like did it come out now because I made it happen or did it come out now because this was the time this was the time it was meant to come out? Like that's that's an I think they call it non-disprovable. Like I don't know. Yeah. But there is something about knowing that if I show up and make myself available, stuff comes. Mm. Like that, a lot of what emerging voices is is giving people that experience enough times in enough different ways that it generalizes. Yes. That they say, yeah. Oh, and it does. Oh, oh, yeah, that's just how it works. Okay, cool. Don't need to fight it. Don't need to create it. Don't need to force it. Don't need to avoid it. It's like, I got it. You know, if I show up, mm. it'll come. If I stop myself, I can do that. Right? I, can, I can absolutely talk myself out of the flow 10 times out of 10. And I can even do it in ways that lots of people will agree with me as to, oh yeah, you needed to stop that. You couldn't have done that. But you, 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 know, you can make great stories. Mm -hmm. And if in any moment you put the story down and just start to, uh, why you can't make up a story about rabbits in 10 minutes and you just start, there'll be a story about rabbits and it'll be surprisingly good. Well, of course, when we... You know, we get caught up in artist block, whether it be writing or whatever it may be. And yes, that has to be just where we're bumping up against the story that it's on us. Well, and I think sometimes for me, the way I experience it is I've done too much emptying and not enough refilling. Tell me more. So I, you know, metaphorically to me, it, it, 
you know, it feels like a, um, a, a water pipe, you know, or a hose. It's like, it's coming from wherever the water is and it's coming through. And if I am disconnected from the source, but I keep, I can keep going for a while, but it's going to get the, it's going to slow a bit and it's going to become more of a trickle and less of a flow. And, and at some point it dries up and I feel blocked. Well, the answer is behind me. Mm. The answer isn't in trying harder to squeeze every last drop out. It's in reconnecting to the source. It's de-kinking the hose, taking your foot off the hose. Mm. But similarly, if I don't let it out, if I just think about it all the time, that's, that's like either what happens is the hose starts to build up and it gets uncomfortable, like you say, or it's like I put a million pinpricks in the hose so the water just trickles out the sides and never really fully comes out. Mm. And, you know, these are metaphors, but they're, they're, they're the best I got to attempt to describe what it feels like. Mm. In its optimal form, the hose is on and you're letting the water out. Mm. like there's no there's nothing more to it than that and yet we make it so complicated sometimes don't we oh god yeah because we make it personal we make it about ah well see my hose had a difficult childhood yeah well you see my hose was cri criticized when it was younger so it's wary of letting the water out and it's like I'm not saying that we can't get in our heads about stuff and that that can't get in the way, but it doesn't have to. It isn't what happened. It is that we're making it relevant to this. Mm. Like there's, there's no genuine connection and I'm gonna get in so much trouble for this and I'm gonna try and take it to the point where I can make the real point because I'm not trying to dismiss what people have gone through. But there is no inherent connection between somebody making fun of a piece of art I did at the age of six and my inability to create art. Right? Everybody had something made fun of as a kid that they did. Not everybody gave a shit. Yeah. Right. So it's not now psychologically. Yeah. That, that can be what you use to block the hose. That can be your reason. Well, I can't because I can't just let it flow because, but, but that's not true. You could in spite of like, I think most great things are created in spite of not because. Oh, I think I probably agree with you there. You know, in spite of the fact that I'm way too busy, you, you know, have so much else going on and I'm in my head all the time, I'm going to create. I mean, I, I, you know, I've already name dropped once, so I'll name drop again. I, 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 I worked with Gary Shandling before he died, the comedian. And I, at one point, uh, he was, uh, he, he kind of got mad at something I said and I, smart ass back. Well, oh, I'm sorry, Gary, am I not praising you enough? And, and, you know, we had a little moment, but then he laughed and he said, don't worry, it's a black hole. There's never going to be enough. Now, he knew that and it didn't stop it. Yes. Right. So often we, we make it a statement about our worth, our value, and we think we need to work on our worth and value and esteem in order to and that's just a great big psychological detour. I mean, I have spent most of my life around artistic types, around creatives. And they're at least as fucked up, neurotic and insecure as, as the rest of humanity, if not more so. So clearly having your shit together is not a prerequisite. But similar, being messed up is not a prerequisite either. Right? You don't have to be, like, like Steve Chandler writes about it brilliantly, you, know, you, you don't have to be this poor tragic soul to create beauty either. Like those are the two myths. 
Well, of course, is the wonderful myth. You have to suffer for your art. Well, right. That's that's <laughs> that's part of it. It's like you know, but that there's a big difference between no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader, mm. which is just about the human condition, than no suffering in the writer, no suffering in the reader. I'm like that sounds like a good thing to me. <laughs> <laughs> like, like you know, and when I read a book, I kind of don't care about what the artist went through to create it. If I see a painting, like if, if I look at a Van Gogh painting without knowing anything about him, I'm not sitting there going, oh my gosh, this guy must have really suffered. I'm just looking at art. Similarly, I, and I don't have a great example in, 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 in the painting world, but if somebody finds painting very simple, it doesn't mean that I find their art easier to dismiss unless I know that and make a story about it. Mm. Right. If I just look at the painting, it moves me or it doesn't. It tickles me or it doesn't. It draws me in or it doesn't. It's nothing to do with what the artist went through. So similarly, I don't place a particular value on, oh, my creation's only any good if it's easy, or my old creation's only any good if I find it hard. It's like, sometimes I'm going to find it easy and sometimes I'm going to find it hard. And as best I can, I don't care. Mm. As much as possible, I'm not even factoring that in. I'm just accepting it. Yeah, some days this is going to flow and some days this is going to feel like hard work. So it's that thing I talk about where people, because of the volume of what I've written over the years, people often say, oh, you must love writing. And the truth is, sometimes... But what I invariably love is reading what I've written. Well, you're I'm an a... avid reader. I don't think I've en known anyone who can quote as many books and immediately remember, oh, there was a quote from there. I mean, it's... But I do that because it delights me. Yeah. I don't do that because it's going to make me a better... No. What... I don't know if it makes me better or if it makes me worse. I don't know. Maybe it makes me Quite less... You. But it's... But but I don't know how else to, you know, I'm going to follow what appeals. I'm going to like, so I can't even put that forward as one should. No. Like, I don't know, but, but one can. Mm -hmm. I'll go with it's, that. it's how, how you enjoy your joy. Well, that sounds nice. Let's do that. <laughs> Well, no, it, you know, anything is only life lifing, but we might as well enjoy it. I mean, there, 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 what there is a romance. There is a romance to the suffering artist idea, right? Like, like there's something about, you know, the, I don't remember what they were called, but all the writers who lived in Paris in the, in the, in the twenties and, you know, Hemingway and Gertrude Stein and that whole community of creatives working together and, you know, getting drunk together and, you know, and, and there's something oddly cooler there was to me when I was younger about being Ernest Hemingway and living the life and blowing your brains out when you're done. Like, and, 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 and yet that no longer has any appeal to me or seems remotely relevant to the act of creation. Like Hemingway wasn't blowing his brains out when he was writing. It was when he was thinking about it. Van Gogh, Van, Van Gogh even talked about in his journals and in his letters to his brother about how the one time he had relief from himself was when he was painting. Oh, and I can get that totally. And I'm sure you can too, that everything drops quiet. Yeah, because it's not about me for a minute. It's, I have permission for it to not be about me, even if I'm writing something personal that's not about me in that moment. And I think we underestimate the value of it not being about you. <laughs> Well, we spend so much time at being about us that, yes, that space of just creative flow is really 
such abuse or space that you can understand why people, painters, you know, so many paint, hundreds of paintings. And as you said earlier, you know, you finish one, you don't want to be out of the flow of that beautiful space. So we're not stopping breathing for three months. We just move on and move on and create more. You know, or you have like a Mark Twain who, you know, the story was that he would have half written articles and stories and books all over his house. And he would just wander through and grab whichever one caught him that day and work on it for a bit. Like, wow. so it was always multiple projects going and he just would work on whichever one was, was, was next. There, there's, a, um, there's a lovely book without an author uh, by which makes sense called The Impersonal Life. I mean, there was an author, but I can't remember his name. He, he went out of his way to not be associated with the book. But, and it's, it's, it's a quite a, if I'm remembering, it's quite a sort of a um, Christian in tone. But one of the things that's interesting about it is that it was Elvis's favorite book for much of his adult life. That like he would take it with him everywhere he went. It was by his, you know, it was on his bedside table. Mm. And, and if you think about Elvis, wait, Elvis, the impersonal life? But for me, and I don't know this, obviously, the reason that makes sense is because as you know, any great performer at their best, it is impersonal. And it's so liberating that it's impersonal. Mm -hmm. Whereas in those moments where it's, I've got to be great again. Well, that's, that's where the stress comes from. That's where the pressure comes from. And that's where the sense of, that's where the blocks start to come is I've got to do it again. How am I going to top it? How am I going to? And that's death. That, 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 that's misery. That's suffering. Definitely. It's not creativity, but yeah. it is suffering. Yeah. And it's often associated with it. Well, of course, the interesting thing is we talk about, you know, we're passionate about our passionate about creating. It comes from the Italian word suffering. Okay, I didn't even know that. But yeah. So don't, be, don't want a passionate relationship. Mm. so interesting that we talk about it you know in that way without actually understanding the meaning that actually it is yeah no i i i, I like expressions like tickles and nudges I like it's, it's it's like oh that idea tickles me let me play with that or i just keep being nudged in this direction let me see what wants to come you know, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll then kind of go against what, what, what I just said and said, and if it feels like passion, fine. Like, again, that doesn't matter. It's, that doesn't matter either. Yeah. In the end, what are you creating? And is it, some, do, do, do you love it? Not do you love the process, but do you love the result? And then you can, you can find ways of being more and more easy with the process. That is really true. Because I know we talk about, you know, sitting in the feeling. And probably for the first time in the last 48 hours, I really sat in the feeling mm. of what was going on up here. And for the first time, didn't listen to a podcast, didn't do my writing, did absolutely nothing, but sat in the feeling of I would describe it as feeling fractured. Hmm. Woke up this morning and I was absolutely fine. I wasn't fractured anymore. So it can't have been real. Yeah. What I love about that is that's what you need to do this time. Mm. Like not, oh, therefore, what I need to do is I need to just sit with the feeling and not do this and not do that. It's like, no, this time, that's what made sense to you to do. Mm. And, and, and there's something about the real time nature of creativity. Mm. Like it, it happens now. Yeah, I might go back later, but when I go back later, I'm working on it now. <laughs> always always and so so while we'll describe it as a process it, it, it's a real-time phenomenon and in real time 
it comes out how it comes out and it just is what it is like like i think that's the we get obsessed about means like how how do i and and it, it, it to my mind when it comes to creating it's like it's not completely who gives a shit because once you're creating, yeah, it's nice to be able to create with more ease and well-being and effortlessness and all that. I'm, I'm all for it, but it isn't the primary point to me. Like, like create. If if you want to, if if you want to create, if you're moved to create, if you're not you're tickled, create. You know, you 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 you, you know over time your your craft will develop in a way that pleases you but initially just get it the fuck out Mm. sorry i probably should have asked at the beginning if i'm allowed to swear on this but hold on you're talking with me (laughs) i must have been anyone i laughed earlier when i thought the only consolation, Mike, if I use the word fuck, you won't be shocked. Yes, but anybody else is. I'm sorry. <laughs> she means it. Thank you, Michael. Oh, a pleasure. So nice to see you. Beautiful. I love you. You know that. Yeah, I do. Thank you. <laughs>